Office hours five. Nick, we're back. I'd like to extend a warm welcome. Thank you. Um, how have you been? Uh, I've been okay. You know, very busy. So excellent. Excited for this. Mm -hmm. it needed mm -hmm. a, a time to just really unwind and you know get some thoughts out. Yeah, I mean, get them out there. Yeah. So we had a. Like, okay, sorry. I guess I should probably ask how you are as well. No, no, no. Yeah, I don't, I don't really care. So, okay, here we go. Um, I am doing fantastic. Oh, that's that's good to hear. Just no reason to complain. Wow. Well done. <laughs> you know? Is that it? Some of your have. Is that it? <laughs> yeah. Are we done here? Okay, let's go home. All right, later. <laughs> but yes, fascinating conversation again. Mm -hmm. Very applicable um, with Brendan Fakini. He touched on sport and a course that he teaches about athletes transitioning out of sport. Uh, he started this course six years ago, and he just talked about its development and the silence that are around this topic. Um, did you have a favorite takeaway or something that was on your mind? The two things that came to mind that I immediately took away from this was, one, how this is not just a transitioning out of sport conversation it's like you guys were saying transition theory this is how we go from one phase of our life to another phase of our life and that is extremely applicable and i think there's a conversation to be had about how you know everybody's probably in one phase of transition in at any point in time all the time mm. right we're either in at some phase all the time so i think that that was something that's um, gaining that perspective was super powerful because um, it is important to I, – I feel like whenever I am in the middle of a situation that maybe I don't understand completely and like it maybe causes anxiety or stress, the more I can understand myself and what I'm going through, the better I can cope with that. Um, so I think that's a really valuable takeaway. Mm -hmm. I also think that there was just so much practicality that could be taken from our conversation around what people can do to like better prepare for those transitions. Or if you're, you know, thinking back and identifying yourself in a transition in a moment, you can then implement some of the things he said to help get yourself smoothly through that transition. So that was my favorite part for sure. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I th it's really important to think about change just in the general aspect of it. And I'm curious about how we learn about change in our life. It's through failure, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's how we really progress is that we try things when we're little. Uh, say we start walking, we fall. And there's someone who's there to support us, but we get back up because it's what we have to do. Um, and so this is like where change starts to kind of happen is that we're, we grow. And I think this is what he was talking about with the development of grit. And that's why he really hits home grit with his student athletes is because that's what they need in order to adapt to change um, in a good way. And they have that because in games and in situations, you have to adapt and you have to change quickly. There are going to be moments in sport to where something doesn't go your way or something goes unexpectedly and you have to be ready for it and change. And that's the skill that needs to carry over when you're in real life. And while this is at a bigger aspect of that, because this is literally a huge piece of identity, uh, that is something that is so paramount to um, the sport itself that it can translate. It's just how do we process it and how do we talk about it? Because it doesn't get talked about. Yeah. And I think that's what you were just saying is actually super fascinating because something different clicked in me that I hadn't really thought of before. And that is as human beings, we are, we are built for adaptation. Like mm -hmm. we're designed to be able to adapt and endure a situation. But it's interesting because you made a comment there about how part of the growth that humans need to go through is experienced through failure mm -hmm. to get us. And I'm almost thinking to myself like, wow, 
I, I wonder how much the, um, positive, like there's a positive adaptation to consistent and prolonged failure throughout life. And maybe what we're seeing in anxiety and depression when it comes to these types of losses is an underdeveloped adaptation mm -hmm. to failure mm -hmm. or loss in this case, right? I don't, I don't know if there's like, if that holds any water, but, um, I'm holding that water. It, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> but it's interesting to think about the fact that maybe somebody who's going through this loss, maybe a predictor for their quality of loss, if you want to say it in that, those terms, yeah. um, is how, how much adaptation to their failure response or their loss response have they endured? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I'm mean, sure part of that's going to come down to like, how have you, have you had your, um, loss response modeled properly by somebody who's also managing that in yeah. a good way too? I think that goes a long way, but, um, yeah, I think, you know, thinking back about our conversation with Brendan, I think that is, you know, pretty relevant to what he's talking about. And I think it kind of helps, helps me sit with the, like what you were just explaining. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something that's coming up for me now too, is the idea of growth versus fixed mindset. Mm -hmm. And while that's probably hopefully instilled in the process of them learning their sport, um, stating that like, oh, you failed at this, so you suck. No, it's you failed at this because you probably haven't practiced it enough. And if you do, you'll get better. Yeah. Um, and rewarding that hard work. I could totally see how the end of sport is a fixed mindset that this was my identity. This is who I was. Now I'm done. And a lot of people can probably portray that on them as well, stating, well, because athletes get a lot, they get their praise from their sport that piece of their identity. That's how people celebrate them, reward them. Um, and that's where they get a lot of their self-esteem, right? Mm -hmm. And so if that's not there, people can say, oh, you're stuck in that identity. You start to feel stuck in that identity. But if people say, like Brennan's saying, hey, these skills are translatable. You still did all of this and there's meaning to it still and you can apply it. Mm-hmm. Um, then I think that growth piece can still be a linear process to where they keep growing. It doesn't have to be a mountain that they have to go down now. Right. It can be something that they're still climbing. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I'm hearing you say that it's a lot about perspective, right? Mm -hmm. What is your, what do you think the end of a career means? The start of something new and now you've got these new skills or the end of something and you have to restart and you're at zero. If you think you're at zero, there's a ton of anxiety that would be around that. If you think, man, I learned so much and it doesn't mean that it's going to translate one-to-one -one into what I'm going to go do next, but I at least have an idea of where to start and then you can adapt from there. And there's a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of positivity that comes out of having that mindset shift of like the growth mindset, like you were saying, like this is something that's, that bettered me and I can continue to be better for yeah. that. Yeah, but how... Like, how hard is that? When, I think it's extremely hard. Right? Yeah. Yeah, because it's going to vary depending on the situation and the person and I think the status of the athlete. But if you're having people who only praised you for this one thing and then you start to go do something else and they don't really like that or they don't really care anymore, then how, yeah, how hard is it to really – find that in yourself to keep pushing on. And are, are you saying that, for example, if somebody was a star athlete, let's say, and their support system only supported them because of their involvement in something mm -hmm. that when this, like when their involvement changes, their support changes and the loss of support in those moments also intensifies the loss of the sport itself. Yes. I think, yeah, that's, that's super, that's piece. extremely difficult. And I think the point you're making, which I totally agree with, is the severity of the loss of support system mm -hmm. during the loss of sport may, again, be a predictor for the severity of the uh, transition. Yes. And I th I think that's what Brennan was saying. And I, I wasn't taking it in that context when he said it the first time. Mm, yeah. I was specifically thinking when he said, you're losing your support network as well. 
was just that like your friends are your team and your coaches support you. Mm -hmm. And so now you're not going to have that, but I could totally see how it's people like your friends and your family who don't see that identity anymore. And so Mm -hmm. it's a different type of interaction that you have with them. Yeah. And like, it's dicey, right? Like it's a very difficult thing to navigate because even the most supportive of people like the person with the ideal supportive scenario where they stop step out of their sport there is still you know factually something different about that person that they do not associate in the same way with their sport Mm -hmm. so yeah even somebody who is got the ideal scenario still has a lot of tricky navigation to do in that in that space and i think you know obviously somebody whose support network is completely tied up in the ex- in their existence as an athlete um is the most extreme negative but there's also the there's a high demand on people to reestablish themselves as a new person and i think that is hard no matter what the situation is mm-hmm. too yeah yeah 100% and thinking about myself like sport for me in soccer, I was a different person kind of on the field, Mm -hmm. you know, like I love to just like get in it. I love to talk smack. It was just fun for me to like have this, I don't want to (laughs) sound super rude, but I just had, I like to have this absurd amount of confidence on the field. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's, it's adaptive for the sport. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, yes, I've, I've found that I can have this in a more controlled environment still uh, in different settings and it's still a part of me but at the same time like god i'd love to play in an adult league right now but <laughs> yeah <laughs> and just go off but covid uh, i mean yeah i understand these circumstances but still yeah it's a it's a huge piece of me that i i really developed over a long period of time and i feel like is something that's still there but is something that i can't express as often mm-hmm. and it's weird Yeah. And I think, you know, this is something I've actually thought a lot about with the idea of like finding your passion. Like that's a very common statement that gets thrown out there. Um, And I think it gives people the wrong idea because I would make the debate that you don't really find your passion. You develop passion for things. Um, And I think it's so easy to think that you like find a sport when you're young and you start playing it. And like you're old enough to really start comprehending things and you think like you just found this thing that's like your passion and then you were lucky enough to be able to do it for as long as you did. But like that was developed within you for so long. And I think that's a, you know, the messaging of finding it makes it seem like you have no control but to search. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very like daunting task for the average person to go out looking for where I think the actual passion came from for people who got engaged in youth sports and like had this long career is spending hours of your life developing skills at something that you were then able to go put on display and like benefit a team, you know, superordinate goals again, like work towards a goal of some kind. So I think a lot of people actually have more ability to develop these passions for themselves in a way that they don't realize. And I think that's why I really loved Brendan's message so much of like, think back to your childhood room because there's probably a lot of things that people had passions for that they have not tapped into for a long time. And they could re you know, stoke the flames of that fire Mm -hmm. and probably develop an equal, if not greater passion, because I think there's a lot to be said about, um, you know, a passion that can really be a lifelong passion that you are never going to lose. And there's probably something more serious about more important in developing those types of passions than, um, you know, something that, you know, your physicality as a human is, is limited and you're not going to be able to compete at the same level all the time. But for example, somebody who plays the guitar, they have that their whole life and they can always turn to it. And so I just think that like as a society, we frame this like finding your passion thing all wrong. And I think that was like a hidden message in what Brendan was saying. That is so, so true. 
Like in terms of career choice, people say, oh, try these different things. Find out what you like. And then there's some messages that are thrown out there stating that people say, I love my work and it doesn't feel like work. And it's like, that's a bunch of bullshit. Like it definitely feels like work sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Sometimes everybody does, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like that needs to be realized that your passion can still feel shitty. Like it can still yeah. feel bad. It's still going to, there are going to be times during this where it's like, God, I, I don't even know if I want to do this anymore. Mm-hmm. And that's part of it because it, you have to experience that. And if you want to experience these really euphoric moments yeah. in this work, mm-hmm. and there's a, a sense of grit that comes out of that for sure. And that's not portrayed. Like, yeah. I feel like the message is that you need to find out something that you really like. And if you experience negative emotion associated with it, that drop, can't be it. Drop it. Get out yeah. of there. <laughs> yeah. Like, and I think work's a great example of where this messaging of finding your passion is so, so, um, damaging for people especially young people like going out in the world feeling like like you know i had this you know we can use the context of sport again like leaving a sport getting your degree and then being like okay like i'm supposed to find what i'm passionate about now like where is it Mm -hmm. and then feeling like they're missing something or they're lost or again like there's something wrong with them because they can't find it yeah um and like you're saying like there's gonna be struggles there's gonna be hard times but what is the there's a Greek term called like techni that means, ugh, God damn it. I'm going to have to look it up. Pardon my language, mom. Um, <laughs> but there's a, I think the Greek word techni in some way refers to, we have derived in our language into the word technique, mm-hmm. but I think it means something else that very much so aligns it with this with this idea that we're talking about right now and it kind of puts hand in hand the fact that technique and skill and refinement is very important in this passion project that everybody's mm-hmm. kind of going through and part of developing these passions is putting yourself through the work and refining the skill to become like a high quality performer in something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like a really important concept that people need to realize is that you're not going to just pick something up, crush it the first time and then be like, cool, found my passion. Perfect. Let's go. Yeah. It's like, you're going to mess up back to the failure. You're going to fail and that's totally fine. There's no shame in that. And you're going to spend a year or two doing something that you're going to realize you cannot develop a passion for, and you're going to start over again. Mm-hmm. And you're going to go through another moment of loss. And that's totally fine also. And it may take you till you're 40, but you know what? People still work at 80. Yeah. So still go have a 40-year career doing something that you found your passion for. Yeah. But yeah, it it takes work. It's personal development. It's like you got to carve yourself out of the experiences that you're going through mm-hmm. to get better at it so that you can provide value in it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm with you. So that's the one of the keys is like really trying to help people fall in love with the process. Yeah. I mean, you can – I'm sure Brennan does this and – because I, I think he he's like developed this course so well and he's the perfect person to really teach something like this because I think there he provides so much validation that it just creates a really positive experience in order to talk about this and open up about it but uh teaching this like teaching loving the process is god I kind of just lost my thought <laughs> that's okay you actually said something keep thinking about it yeah but that got me thinking is one thing that brendan i think expressed that hit me kind of after the fact that i think is super important that we didn't get a chance to touch on is the way he kind of cultivates this safe space for try for dipping your toe back into something that you like maybe didn't do before or were never good at right like if you're getting around, like maybe you and somebody else in your class or you and a friend like wanted to try the skateboarding, like he said, mm-hmm. I think most people will not try something because of the fear 
of being judged for it. Mm -hmm. But when you know that on Monday night from 6 to 9 p.m., you're going to show up to class and you're going to be able to share your experience and people are going to be stoked for you because you yeah. you found – like that's – there's a lot of safety in knowing that the thing you're about to go try, that you're going to you're gonna fail an ollie for two hours on a skateboard and like that's fucking great. Yeah. You know, like we're, I'm happy – you went out there and I think he does a really good job of doing that and making fe people feel confident in their lack of experience in something because that's, I think the biggest hurdle that a yeah. lot of people don't approach is that like just getting started in something that is uncomfortable. Jesus, that is so true. Athletes transitioning out of sport, they're done with their sport. They go home, they try to find a different career. They take different classes if it's an interest that maybe their family or their friends don't support, then it's just going to like completely be like, Jesus, well, I don't want to do this either now. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like I'm a failure. And then you're reminded that, God, I, I should have just done sport, right? Like yeah. that, that was my identity. Like I can't freely express what I want to do and can't feel that same support. And I think that's, yeah, right. Like doing the thing that you know that when you come home, you know, to put the class context of what he does by making everybody do something for three, like three things for three hours. Mm -hmm. And then knowing you're going to have a support system to share that with. I think if you're doing something that you don't feel like is supported and you come home and you can't share it. The two things he said to do when I asked him, what are the two, like what, what are some things people can do? He said, identify early who your support system and network is going to be mm -hmm. and get those people on your team like yeah. quick and then find something like go check your childhood room and see what you would have been doing and try new things well if you try a new thing and your support system is off and you can't come home and talk about it you might as well have not done it Seriously? because you're gonna you're gonna not want to do it if you can't share it or you're not gonna be able to find joy in it mm -hmm. if you can't at least express the joy you're feeling with people so i think that's a great point i think that people if you don't have that it's even more, it literally takes the second thing you have to have out of the equation and it's already potentially failed. Yeah. He's, he's even more spot on than I thought. Yeah. And right? I thought he was pretty spot on. I mean, shoot. <laughs> well done, Brennan. Yeah. <laughs> but back to what I was thinking about earlier, mm -hmm. it was the point that you can fail repeatedly and the best part about the process is like achieving some sense of competency for sure and like developing that grit along the way. And I think Brennan probably does this in a reflective sense with his students is that, Hey, your career in your sport, you failed many, many times. You were not good at one point mm -hmm. and you probably had a low point in your career. I, I think that's what I've noticed too. Like all athletes at some point have a weird phase to where they're growing is off or their maturity is off and so they're like not that good for a year or two and then they get super good like a little bit later or they're super good when they're younger mm -hmm. um so yeah at some point you were not good at all probably yeah and you had to develop grit you had to develop practice and skills and that whole process can be translated to you can do this again like you have time and you've developed the skills in order to like you've shown that you can do this. Mm -hmm. um, it and just has to be in something that you're interested in. Yeah. And we get started so young in this country that I think we forget that. Yeah. You know, I don't remember me being six, trying new sports and gaining new skills. I don't. You tried so many new things when you tried were six. so many new things. And then like, you know, granted, like my athletic career did take a big shift in high school. I stopped playing basketball, mm -hmm. which I'd played for my whole life and my freshman year of high school, I picked up a brand new sport. And maybe, maybe that is why I was able to transition out of volleyball so easy mm, because yeah. I literally went from, I showed up to two basketball practices, like the, the summer practice, oh, yeah. whatever dropped. It was like, yeah, I'm not going to do that anymore. Saw my brother go through the high school program. Like wasn't a big fan of it. Like didn't think it was for me. Picked up a new sport, kind of just dropped it, no problem. And then like, you know, you see that first p person who is like really skilled at the sport you're trying to get into and you're like, damn, <laughs> I'm getting there. Right. You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden you're like on this path to like 
learning all these new skills. But yeah, that's interesting that like the combination of like the failures, the -hmm. transitions, like it's, it's like a learned skill to be able to like put some of that stuff behind you. And yeah, damn, never thought about that before. Did you just hit on the significance of like a mentor? Maybe. Because, I mean, I think, you know, what I was referring to specifically was um, a teammate. Yeah. um, Who I won't say necessarily was a mentor, Mm -hmm. but was a competitive push that I needed in order to continue to develop. And we had a superordinate goal together. So he was encouraging Mm -hmm. of me continuing to progress in my own skill. Um, So yeah, I think that was super important. I don't know if a mentor would have played the same role. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I think the context of a teammate may have been a little bit different, but yeah. What do you think about the mentor role? I'm shifting the definition a little bit of mentor. Mm -hmm. I'm not specifically stating that cultish pyramid scheme mentor that like is thrown out there right now. Not a corporate mentor. <laughs> yeah. A skill sharing mentor. Yeah. Someone who helps you learn in your process and they're already at a level that you want to be at. Mm-hmm. And so you're really motivated to get there and you feel comfortable doing so because it is collaborative mm-hmm. and it's supportive and they're going to be critical of you when you're not doing well because they want more of you. Yeah. And actually, even just the way you describe that, I mean, I think very similarly, the like older brother type of a a situation, Mm -hmm. right? Like the younger brother wants to always be involved in what the older brother is talking about. Actually, the book right there, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, the first chapter is about outliers. And when the month you were born, oh, yeah, directly translates to your success the probability of success, not, it's not a guaranteed thing, but the probability of success in, in youth athletics, Mm -hmm. because if you hit the age band just right, then you're going to develop more rapidly than everybody else. And you're going to have positive reinforcement from your success. That success is going to translate to all-star and, you know, travel leagues. That's going to get you more high level experience. You're going to develop at a faster rate than everybody else. More confidence. Um, Yeah. So like, yeah, that, that positive reinforcement of challenge, whether it be, you know, like we're saying, like age group competition, a sibling who's a year or two above you. Like in my case, I had an older brother. He was two years ahead of me. And I constantly wanted to catch up to what level he was at. So it made me work harder. Mm -hmm. And it could be the same thing with a teammate. Like when I started playing volleyball, I very vividly remember seeing this teammate just like have skills that I was like, that's where I need to try and get to, Mm -hmm. you know? So I think there's a lot to that, that, you know, people don't really realize. Yeah. Maybe that's something to really consider. Finding a skill mentor when you're trying to tap it back into these things from your childhood. Yeah. Cause I think, Anybody in sport can relate to what you just said. Like when you said that, when you saw somebody who you wanted to be at, I had a picture immediately pop into my head of a similar experience for myself. And Mm -hmm. that's what drove me for about four years to get really good at what I was doing and uh, to be the kind of leader I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And when you have somebody like that in that role, who's just like so committed and dedicated and so, so perfectly crafted at their skill it's so motivating and Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe that is what's really necessary in that transition is somebody who's going to be, yes, we've already touched on that. Like somebody who's going to be a really good leader and a mentor for you. Mm -hmm. The problem is it's, it's going to be hard to find because your interests are going to be tough. So there's still going to be that exploratory phase of finding out what you want to do. And then once you find that out, Like then maybe you can find a mentor. Yeah. It's not the first step. Yeah. But I think there's a point where you hit this like developmental blockage of like, you need somebody to model after at a certain point, just to, just to keep your own 
progress flowing like unless you're some kind of like genius type of a like you it was just your calling and you hadn't tapped into it um but yeah like if i was like for to go back to the skateboarding example i wouldn't know where to start on like certain skills unless somebody could like start walking me through and like showing me and then i could watch them do it and like mm-hmm. some of that stuff so um yeah i think it's I think it's super valuable. Like we were saying, not the first thing I would do. I would do some exploring of these different things, but I think it'd be really important to do that. Yeah. Once you get into a field you like or a career you like, find somebody who's doing well who can really support you and wants to support you Mm -hmm. because that will be a huge boost. Yeah. Wow. Damn. I think we've touched on some good stuff. Yeah. The interesting thing is, this is my favorite piece about all of this. And this is my favorite piece about psychology in general is that like the stuff we're saying is not like crazy <laughs> information that is like brand new. Like no. it's very basic when it comes down. And to a lot of it's intuitive. Yes. People kind of feel it already without yeah. having to think about it. But once I've always just enjoyed like breaking it down as to mm-hmm. why yeah. and like understanding each specific piece of the puzzle. Um, Cause it just makes so much more sense in my head now. Yeah the synthesis of these ideas together to answer a very specified question is what makes like the talk talking through this very valuable because I mean, and maybe this can be a transition into, you know, some of the things that we think like the most practical things that we feel like we could pull out of that conversation with Brendan. Um, but yeah, I think being able to talk about all of these different factors and like ideas within psychology but then contextualizing them for a specific thing to then validate exactly what we're feeling and what we should do Mm -hmm. is super important because if like i said before like understanding my own situation helps me process my own situation Mm -hmm. um so i think that's exactly what we were able to accomplish with our conversation yeah the silence around it is the problem Mm -hmm if they are allowed to process what's going on and their next steps and how they're going to achieve that, then it becomes a much more uh, simpler task and Mm -hmm. a much more seemingly achievable task. Mm -hmm. So practicalities that you took away. Yeah. I mean, so like, for example, the, one of the first things I thought of in like reflecting on the conversation was like, okay, if he's saying pick a few things, have your support network, all of that, I'm like, I started making a list and the list contained things, not only that I would want to do, but things I am doing and, you know, making sure that I had all these things there to help with like whatever transition I may be in that maybe I don't even realize I'm in. Um, so I did that and I actually think, you know, I actually feel like I do a fairly decent job. I feel like this podcast is one of those things Mm -hmm. that I do just because I want to do it. And I like really enjoy sitting down and having conversations with uh, you and our very gracious professors to share the time with us. Mm -hmm. Um, And like between that and working out, you know, and doing, you know, a few other like here and there type of things, I do a pretty good job at doing that. Yeah. Um, but I feel like that's a good place for people to start, right? If they're feeling like just like you're just hitting a wall and you, maybe you do two things regularly, but you don't feel like it's enough to really have pulled you into the, maybe the emotional state you would like to be in. Maybe you're feeling like that down moment and you're like, yeah, working out and doing a podcast with Nick is not what I want to do right now. Um, you need to continue to explore what some of those other things could be and give yourself more options. Yeah. And uh, so I think that's a good place for people to start is do a full on list of everything that you could want to do. Put some audacious ones out there too, you know, mm-hmm. put some things that like maybe you wouldn't have ever thought of before, like, you know, perfecting the perfect steak barbecuing and like, or cooking for some people that you don't know, or like just setting some other little goal or task for yourself. But um, that way you actually have like a starting point when you hit that moment. I think that's the biggest practical thing that I pulled out of it. Mm. 
Yeah. And encouraging people in my life to do it. You know, I think that this is something that's valuable to everybody. I was talking to my mom about it today and, you know, talking about things that she could do. And, you know, mm-hmm. so just like making sure that everybody's finding that time for themselves to get their own recharge. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I telling everybody you know about it. Mm-hmm. Something that's super important. I think I'm going to take away really being more mindful in my interactions with like the kids that I coach and then also just other student athletes that I know Mm -hmm. uh, or athletes that I know because there have been so many times to where I think that I'll only see them and maybe I'll ask specifically about sport and that's it. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's all they hear. (laughs) Like I know. Yeah. It's hard to like, (laughs) approach somebody who you know because of your interaction with them in sport and then validate them in ways that are other than their sport Mm -hmm. but i think it's important like you're saying to do that ask about family or Mm -hmm. ask about what else do they do Mm -hmm. something like that i think that's something i would want to try to do more like that um and i think with your point about just like trying to experience other things i've been thinking about this recently like over the past week i've it's something that's really come up for me uh, is just, the, I mean, I go back to this debate all the time during office hours. Is technology and social media more positive or more negative? And I think I made up my mind. <laughs> I think I'm stating You're saying it's it right 100% here. more positive. Because okay. the access to lectures, to classrooms, to anything is just here. Like, I was thinking that there are times to where I get hard on myself a little bit about being on my phone so much, Mm -hmm. but most of the time I'm on my phone, I'm listening to some podcast Mm -hmm. and it's more so benefiting me than when I was younger, I was just like, what, doing nothing, like maybe kicking a ball up against the wall. Like, yeah, that's nice, but Mm -hmm. I'm stimulating my brain that way. But through listening to a podcast or listening to a free course lecture online, Mm -hmm. then there's just this constant amount of information that I can get that could be helpful to me that is just, I feel like, net positive. Oh, yeah. And at the same time, I need to, like, take a break sometimes. <laughs> I'm going to give you a quote oh, that I think me. summarizes what you're saying. With great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so true, right? That is Like, it. social media is this huge powerhouse, but, like, we got to be responsible about it. Mm-hmm. We have to leverage it for the things that, are going to be of a benefit and if we're not then it we're like not being responsible with it yeah and because i agree like you can learn anything you want on youtube and you wouldn't have been able to do like think back to when you were 12 years old incredible access to different things and that's huge i think like you're saying podcasts like i listened to a a really interesting podcast today done by two podcasters talking about podcasting i mean Shoot, <laughs> shoot. <laughs> we wouldn't have known exactly like what to do here if we didn't have access to We were like we that. at least spent 10 hours on YouTube. Yeah. Maybe each. Oh yeah. Just trying Easily. to figure things out. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I mean So try stuff out. Responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> continue to use, use it, it responsibly. responsibly. Yeah. <laughs> good talk, Brennan. Yeah, that was good. I like that. Yeah. And thanks again, Brennan, if you're listening. Uh, We really appreciated that conversation. And we hope to break some stigma around that topic as well. Absolutely. Uh, Next week, we have another interview for you coming from one of Brennan's past professors, actually. Do you want to give a little background? We'll just say that we're taking a deep dive into the post COVID work landscape there's a little Hmm. sprinkle of uh something for you just some zest well thanks for tuning in see you soon peace